Good afternoon, Patriots. Constitution Vet here, and welcome back to my channel. Today, we'll be finishing our multi-part analysis into the theme, History is Gray. Now, before we do that, I want to give a huge shout out to everyone who has supported me in creating this channel. I currently have 221 subscribers, and I sincerely appreciate every single one of you. I honestly never thought I would be in this amazing position, yet here I am. The truth is, after experiencing channels like CanCon, Nick Mosedir, Neil Johnson, The Hizzy, Officer Tatum, I was inspired to create something at that level. Now, granted, I may not have the political or economic prowess, but I do have my love of history. And all those people have put their hand into the fight. Myself, I want to do the same thing. My way of doing that is by using history. More importantly, my love of history. That love can hopefully bring understanding to our past while also solidifying our future. So again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for all y'all's support. It means the world to me. All righty, now that's done, let's move on with the lesson. The past two videos have dug into the grayness of history. The first highlighted the importance of seeing the past through the villain's perspective, the bad guy, the enemy. The second video dealt with the topic of reparations and how the idea of repaying for ancestral suffering is impossible to achieve. Today, we'll be surveying the final component in understanding the grayness of history. Romanticism versus realism. This is one of my favorite topics to teach, as it is a topic that everyone can relate to and easily understand. So without any further ado, let's get started. Now, what does the word romanticism actually mean? To answer that question, let's break it down to its key component the act of romanticizing something. What does that mean? Well, you can look at it different ways. You can look at it as seeing things through rose-colored glasses, or you could look at it as only looking at the good things and not the bad. But what does romanticizing something actually look like? If you want to apply it to modern day, you can look at a car, right? And you can say, oh, I love Chevys. Chevys are perfect. Chevys are amazing. There's nothing wrong with Chevys at all. They're all great. They're all perfect. Are they all great and perfect? Or do they have some flaws? No, no, no. They're great. They're perfect. They're amazing. There's nothing wrong with them. That's romanticizing something. You're completely ignoring the possible flaws that might be there. Let's look at Star Wars. For all my nerds out there, I love Star Wars. Star Wars is amazing. Star Wars is my life. If I were to romanticize Star Wars, I would say Star Wars is perfect. Every single film, book, video game is absolutely perfect. It's amazing. Well, here's the problem with that, though. It's not perfect. Even in Empire Strikes Back, one of the greatest films of all time, still has its flaws. Now, I know I might lose some subscribers for that statement, but it's that's just my opinion. <laughs> the point is, we can romanticize a lot of modern day things. Now let's bring it back to history. What things in history do we typically romanticize? Well, first thing that comes to mind is US history. When you look at things like the American West, the American frontier, the idea of being completely free, independent, that lone cowboy running off into the sunset, saving the day. There's something romantic about that. There's something that has drawn people to that topic. If we want to be realistic, the American West was actually very violent, very brutal. Another era in history is World War II. And one way that that has been romanticized is through film. For example, The Longest Day, a classic film that showed the landing at Normandy on D-Day. Now, while the film itself is still a really good film, there are a lot of romanticized elements in it. 
For example, when the Allied forces are landing at Normandy, there's one scene where there's like a full bird colonel with his enlisted soldiers telling his guys, all right, boys, let's go get them. Yeah. And they're all like cheering. Yeah, let's go get the Germans. Yeah. That's not historically accurate. Let me just say that. But it feels good. And it came out in a time where the American public needed something to remind them how good we were and how noble our endeavor was. So again, that isn't necessarily bad, but that is an example of romanticizing history. Now, on the other spectrum, if you want to go realistic, Saving Private Ryan, to this date, is still one of the most accurate depictions of the D-Day landing. Veterans, historians, all attest to this. And if you compare the longest day in Saving Private Ryan, <laughs> you can see very clear differences. The longest day is very romanticized. It shows the actual event happening, but does not show you the brutality of warfare. Now, here's where it gets good. Out of all those historical topics I just mentioned, none of them even come close to the level of romanticism that will be in the next topic. This next topic will be the main focus of this video. And that historical topic is pirates. That's right, patriots. Caribbean piracy remains as one of the most romanticized time periods in human history. Our goal today is to figure out why. Why is it that Caribbean piracy has captured the imaginations of people from all walks of life. Not just in America, mind you, but all over the world. This time period, known as the Golden Age of Piracy, only lasted from 1650 to 1730. It wasn't a long time period. And yet, something about it makes us love it. I don't just mean have a like for it. I mean have a sick, committed, fascination for it. This topic has embedded itself into global culture. Let's dive into this together. When I mentioned that Caribbean piracy has embedded itself within our culture, we see examples of that every single day, from sports teams to movies, Halloween, drinks, video games, even books. If you Google the phrase pirate books, the first thing that comes up is a plethora of books geared towards very young audiences celebrating Caribbean piracy. Even this one, The Pirate of Kindergarten. This shows that our culture doesn't just embrace Caribbean piracy, but it includes it in young children's minds. It tells our kids, hey, being a pirate is good. It's fun. Yeah. In fact, let's go back. Don't even get me started on the hypocrisy of Halloween. Our kids grow up thinking, oh, piracy is great. It's awesome. It's good. It's fun. You get to be a rambunctious kid. Arr, fight against the system. Arr, matey. Arr. It's fun. But here's where it gets just so good. And this is why I love history so much. The more you dig into history, <laughs> the more you realize uh, just how horribly inaccurate images like this truly are. The more you dig into history, the more you realize just how much our culture romanticizes a time period that was not fun. It was far from innocent. And pirates were not good guys. They were not good people. The golden age of piracy, which again ranges from 1650 to 1730, was a time period of sheer violence and brutality. When we talk about pillaging and plundering, that's not a fun, happy-go-lucky, yo-ho, yo-ho, a pirate's life for me. No, 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 no. Pirates in the Caribbean literally raped, pillaged, and plundered the Caribbean. 
it was not a fun thing to see or do. It was vicious. It was brutal. It was violent. And yet, somehow, Caribbean piracy has embedded itself within our culture as being acceptable, totally fine. So to be clear, I'm not trashing on this topic. I love this topic. I think Caribbean piracy is fascinating. However, we need to understand what it means to romanticize history and to be more realistic towards history. Before we go any further, let's get a better understanding of what a pirate actually is. When you think of the word pirate, what images typically come to mind? Some images may include scenes like the captain and his crew divvying up the booty after a successful plundering of a nearby Spanish galleon, or a band of rough scallywags coming into port after they just successfully pillaged and plundered the town. The epic scene of Blackbeard's last stand as he fights against English sailors trying to board Queen Anne's Revenge. Or simply just the image of you and your crew sailing the seven seas, the ocean sea breeze in your hair, flying the Jolly Roger, going against anyone who dares call themselves king or queen. However, piracy is way more complex than that. To give you a very brief run through, the word pirate didn't actually become a thing until later on into the golden age of piracy. See, people back then didn't just wake up and say, I want to be a pirate. It wasn't like that. The term pirate actually came from two other groups of people. You had privateers who were sailors. They acted as mercenaries. If you were a privateer, Nations such as England or France would pay you to attack the Spanish. See, in the early 1600s, the Spanish had a complete monopoly or control of the Caribbean. They completely dominated it. In order to fight against that domination, other imperial powers, again, such as England or France, would pay sailors to go into Spanish territory and attack Spanish ships. This was a legal form of piracy. The other group of people were known as buccaneers. You probably heard that word before for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers or Captain Morgan, who was a real life buccaneer. Buccaneers began as hunters on the island of Hispaniola. These hunters were eventually chased off by the Spanish. See, the Spaniards kind of dug their own grave. They didn't want to share any land with anyone but themselves. On Hispaniola, the Spaniards slaughtered all the animals that the buccaneers hunted. The Spaniards also conquered the natives. So the buccaneers, having no food supply, no way of living, were forced off the island onto the land of Tortuga. From there, the buccaneers then created an actual self-sustaining colony of sorts, a buccaneering colony. Over time, the buccaneers became so pissed off at the Spanish that they started attacking Spanish ships. Eventually, the privateers would lose their legal form of employment, thanks to the Treaty of Reisvik. This treaty basically was a peace agreement between the major powers, England, France, and Spain. Even though that meant peace for those powers, it also meant no jobs for the privateers. And so how else are they going to make money? All they know is sailing. Well, let's just attack everyone. Hence, they became pirates. The buccaneers, who again were chased off of their land and their livelihood taken away from them, were forced into piracy as well. That is when you have the term pirate. Now, let's be clear. The life of a pirate was not a good, fun life. If you lived past the age of 30, you were considered Superman. You could die any moment. You were always hunted. And your health was not a major concern. So again, let's go back to the main question. What is it about piracy that we love so much? To be clear, we don't romanticize Chinese piracy. We don't romanticize Middle Eastern piracy. We don't even romanticize modern day piracy off the coast of Somalia. So what is it about the Caribbean that makes us love it so much? After all the research that I've done on this topic, 
I've come to a simple conclusion. The reason why we love Caribbean piracy is because it feels good. If you look at any image of the Caribbean, what do you see? Crystal blue waters, palm trees, coconuts, white sands. It automatically looks beautiful. Okay. What else? Freedom. What feels good? Freedom feels good. And who had complete and total freedom? Your typical pirate crew. Let's analyze that for a second. If you want to talk about real democracy, it did not start in ancient Greece. It started on a pirate ship. Your typical pirate crew was the ultimate definition of real, true liberty, democracy, and freedom. Here's what I mean by this. A pirate crew consisted of people from all walks of life. It didn't matter what your skin color was. It didn't matter what your past profession was. It didn't even matter if you were man or a woman. Even Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, two examples of female pirates that were forces to be reckoned with. It didn't matter how much money you made before. Once you joined that pirate crew, you had things that no one else had in that time period. For example, the right to vote, the ability to have a say in everything that happens on board a ship. That was unheard of in this time period. Early forms of healthcare and workers' comp. That's right. If you lost a hand, for example, in a battle, you were compensated for that loss. If you lost a leg, you were financially compensated for that loss. Food. The place to get the best food in the Caribbean was not on board a royal vessel for a navy. It was on a pirate ship. Think about it. Pirates didn't really make anything. They didn't grow crops. They weren't expert chefs. They took what they wanted. The pirate crew saw a Spanish galleon. They're going to attack it and take everything. The idea of pirates being on a crew starving like you might see in films is not entirely accurate. There were a few times when pirate crews suffered from starvation. But for the most part, pirate crews had their fill of food that they stole. And after a long voyage, when you make port, pirates had tons of money to spend. Why? Because it wasn't theirs. They just took it. So life as a pirate meant you live every day like it's your last. Now back onto the topic of voting. If a pirate captain wanted to attack an English ship or a Spanish fort, he had to get the vote from the crew. Yeah, the crew all had to agree to that fight. If the crew said, no, we don't want to fight, the captain has to follow that crew's vote. The captain cannot ignore that. Now, if the crew did choose to fight, then the captain had complete and total say over everything that happened on board. All those reasons can help explain why we may love Caribbean piracy. But we need to understand the brutal realities of it. Life on board a pirate ship was great in a lot of ways. However, you were hunted down by imperial powers. When you raided a village or attacked a town, you didn't just run in going, ah, and scare people. No, you legit slaughtered innocent people. You burned cities down to the ground. Pillaging and plundering is not a pretty time. It was brutal. And the innocent people in that town who did nothing against you were, well, victims. Another dark component of piracy is the fact that they were thieves. They took what they wanted, when they wanted, however they wanted. If that meant torturing you for information on gold, so be it. If that meant slaughtering your whole family in front of your eyes, so be it, no problem. They're taking what they want. Also, your day-to-day -day health as a pirate wasn't top priority. Many pirates suffered under scurvy, malaria, even various forms of STDs, even dental care was not a big priority for pirates. With all that being said, Caribbean piracy still remains as a highly romanticized historical topic. Now, what can we do with this? How can we apply this to modern day? How can we use historical romanticism on things such as Caribbean piracy and apply that to modern day practical skills. Here's how you do that. One example is college. Let's say you're a high school senior and you find this one in college that's like perfect. 
it looks great it feels great you even watch on campus and it just feels so amazing you're like i'm in i'm doing it let's go no questions asked i'm in well that's a form of romanticism you are romanticizing this college you only see the good one way to find that balance however between romanticism and realism is to ask yourself are there any cons is there anything bad about this college? Is there any negatives about this college? If you cannot find a single negative thing, I would advise you to walk away from that for a second because then you're not being a good critical thinker. And that's the point of education is to become a better critical thinker. A final example of how you can use the historical topic of romanticism into the modern day is the ability to listen to how people speak if you pay close attention especially to press briefings or commercials or senate hearings house hearings you can point out the people who respond with romanticized words fluff emotional feel-good words then you can point out the people who focus on the realism, who don't use fluffy, feel-good words, who give you the cold, hard evidence, the data, the facts, the numbers with no fluff. And sometimes, if you listen closely, you can find certain people that create a beautiful balance between the two. And that is a goal for all of us to achieve. We need to provide the data. We need to provide the resources, the evidence, but we also need to be willing to add in a few emotional words to create that connection with people. In closing, this served as the final chapter to our History is Gray miniseries. Like I said in my intro video, I'm not doing this for money. I'm not doing this for fame. I'm doing this to contribute what little I can to our fight our fight for liberty, and our fight for freedom. Now, before you go, if you can, please make sure to like and subscribe. I would greatly appreciate it. Also, if you would like to donate to this channel, my PayPal link is in the top right corner of my wallpaper image uh, for my channel. Never surrender, never submit. This is Constitution Vet, signing out.